Professor Gattinger is very well known at the University of Ottawa where she is, uh, uh, she's, uh, works at the School of Political Studies. She also is an author and uh, she's currently working on a book right now on Canada-U.S. energy and energy climate change relations since the coming into force of the free trade arrangement with uh, the United States. So I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to share uh, the panel with two uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful presenters. It's also rare to be at an energy event and see more than uh, a few female faces in the room, room, particularly on panels, so I greatly appreciate the opportunity. I'd also, of course, like to thank the Atlantic Council for the opportunity to come and, and speak with you today. Um, as Mike mentioned, my research has explored Canada, U.S. Uh, and broader North American policy uh, relations, and the title that was given to me for today uh, is actually really well covered by Professor Crandall's uh, presentation earlier on today, so I'm very pleased for that. She did an absolutely phenomenal job of really going through how the market context uh, has changed in North America. What I'd like to, to turn to is I'm still going to be continuing on that theme, but really looking at it and pushing a little bit further in terms of um, policy and policy relations in North America, both Canada, U.S. and Mexico, but also internally uh, in Canada. And, and I think one of the things that this market change has brought about is absolutely opportunity. Certainly, that was underscored in Professor Crandall's uh, presentation. But one of the other things that it's really brought about is it's changed fundamentally the context to one of extreme uncertainty. Right? So you've got an industry uh, in which, uh, in policy terms, in political terms, in market terms, in technological terms, um, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what the future is going to look like. Uh, we can have projections, and we do have multiple projections, as Professor, Professor Crandall uh, pointed out, but as we know, if we were to go back five years, those projections look very different, uh, so things certainly can change. As they say, there's nothing harder to predict um, than the future. And this, in an industry where, as some of the presentations made already here today have, have uh, underscored, we've got an industry where investments are in the billions of dollars, with time horizons not in the next year or the year after, time horizons in the decades. Um, I often think of the energy sector as a, a very large ship that can be very challenging to turn, particularly when it comes to infrastructure. infrastructure. So I'm going to be unpacking that a little bit here um, in my presentation today. I'm going to start out with a little bit of context in terms of energy policy making uh, in contemporary times and the real challenges that, that energy policy makers face. I'm going to look a little bit at Canada-U.S. energy relations and sort of how, um, what the defining features have been of Canada-U.S. energy relations um, since about the mid-1980s and the extent to which those are now being called into question. I'll look at North American energy markets and talk very briefly about the shale revolution, which was so extremely well covered by Professor Crandall, and then end off talking a little bit about the impacts on Canada and Canada-U.S. Uh, energy relations. Um, I often say to students when it comes to energy policy, because of course, uh, having my own self-interest, I'm always trying to get them interested in, in studying energy policy, so I've got some interesting graduate uh, students to work with, uh, but there has been no better time to study energy policy. Uh, certainly when I first started studying energy policy in the kind of mid-1990s, late 1990s, um, it was just not a policy sector with the amount of dynamism, change, and uh, really fundamentally fascinating questions to be exploring both politically, uh, economically, and, and socially. And I don't envy energy policymakers uh, in the present period. They really are in search of what I think of as sort of the holy grail uh, of energy policy, which is very challenging to, uh, to, to find, which is identifying the appropriate balance, point, balance points between four key policy imperatives. The first of which is energy as a market. All right, so if you think about energy policy in the 1970s, 1980s, into the 1990s, a lot of the focus was on trying to get energy markets to work better, to liberalize energy trade, to deregulate in oil and gas, to restructure. We first called it deregulation, then we realized it didn't quite work. Then we called it restructuring in the electricity uh, sector in the 1990s. So really trying to make sure that we've got energy markets that are working properly, competitively, efficiently, uh, et cetera. And these various imperatives have layered on top of one another over time. So in addition to market, we've got environment. 
Right, so environmental considerations becoming increasingly uh, challenging, vexing, broadening uh, in scope. Uh, again, as, as we saw over the, the 1980s, 1990s, so everything from species at risk, climate change, ecosystem health, you know, a broad range of environmental issues that are related to the exploration, production, distribution, and consumption uh, of energy. The third policy imperative is security. Imperatives. We're talking about that uh, here today, and as we know, energy security, certainly from the U.S. perspective, over uh, various periods of time, there have been real changes in terms of thinking through what are the key security imperatives when it comes to uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. energy, and certainly over the last couple of decades of, uh, of the 20th century, a real increasing concern around energy security, given growing uh, dependence on foreign imports, particularly, uh, particularly for oil. But in the post-9-11 period, security broadened, right? So considerations of security broadened out to critical infrastructure protection. Most recently, we've seen some very disturbing uh, reports coming forward about um, you know, cyber, uh, potential cyber attacks on critical energy infrastructure. Uh, if you think about the electricity grid, this is the largest computer uh, known uh, here in North America that we've got, the interconnected grid in North America, which you know, in some uh, uh, senses is, becomes very vulnerable to, uh, to cyber attacks. So security imperatives, market, environment, security, and then the fourth imperative, and this is one that I think is bringing us here today, is that increasingly the, the need for governments to be developing socially acceptable responses to energy policy. Right? So we are seeing increasingly, it's very difficult now. When I first started studying energy, it was kind of a boring area. People are, why would you be interested in that? You know, it's so technical and regulatory. Um, now it is very difficult to you know, open up a newspaper, turn on the radio or the television uh, without hearing some sort of socially, uh, social opposition to energy projects of various descriptions. And the nature of opposition has changed as well. Right, so when you could look in the past to sort of the 1980s, 1990s, focusing mostly in on nimbyism, right? not in my backyard. So don't put whatever that energy project is in my backyard. Um, and moving to much more challenging forms of principled opposition to energy development. Right? And so now we have these new uh, acronyms that uh, probably some of you have heard before, banana syndrome. Has anybody heard this? Yes, I'm sure Professor Crandall has and others have. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. <laughs> Try being a policymaker facing that, right? Or nope, not on planet Earth. <laughs> That has fundamentally changed the context, and I think it's really important to bear this in mind. And so those four imperatives, market, environment, security, and social acceptability, form this handy acronym, MESS. So the question is, what kind of mess are governments going to make out of energy policy? Is it going to be a mess, like the mess I walk into when I go into my teenager's room, which is terrifying? Um, or is it mess in the sense of a mess hall? I had a lovely lunch today at the uh, officer's mess here, where people come together to meet their shared needs. I had a great conversation with people I hadn't met before uh, at, a, at a table at lunch. So what sort of a framework are they going to be approaching energy policy with, with what kind of, a, uh, what kind of dynamics in terms of policy making? So moving from that, so that sort of holy grail of, of energy policy, and the reason that I don't uh, envy energy policy makers, but I absolutely love to study energy policy. Um, moving on to looking at Canada-US energy relations. Since about the mid-1980s, so let's say Canada-US free trade agreement uh, period, five features have characterized Canada-US uh, relations. First and foremost, they're market-based relations. Right? The Canada-US free trade agreement liberalized energy trade. And as a result of that, you know, the, the, the flows of energy are predominantly uh, affected by the laws of supply and demand. And so governments intervene, they structure the investment climate, they structure the regulatory environment, et cetera. Uh, but first and foremost, energy relations between Canada and the United States are really between producers, consumers uh, of, of energy. Second, Canada, since that period of time, has been a net exporter of energy to the United States. And this is true in oil and gas and electricity. It doesn't mean that Canada doesn't import from the US. We absolutely do, we have. But if you look at the overall relationship, Canada has been a net uh, exporter. Third, when it comes to sort of policy relations between the two countries, these have mostly been managed under the radar, right? Yes, you see 
you know, from time to time, energy finds its way on top of political agendas, and you see uh, discussions between the Prime Minister and the President, for example, but for the most part, it's a myriad of relationships taking place between um, officials in uh, analogous uh, uh, agencies across, uh, across the border. Fourth, these relationships clearly are mostly north-south relations. Right, energy flows are mo mostly north-south, but they're also mainly regional as well. So it's one thing to talk about overall trade figures, but really if you break that down, you begin to see how it, uh, how it falls out across, uh, uh, across the two countries. And then fifth, um, Canada-U.S. energy relations, yes, there have been frictions here and there, but for the most part, they've been mutually beneficial and harmonious. Right, so the Canada-U.S. energy relationship is often held up not so much recently, okay, for obvious reasons, but has often been held up as a shining example of Canada-US collaboration at its finest, right? This is where we really work well together. And from the Canadian perspective, that the United States represents a really significant market opportunity uh, for uh, Canadian energy resources. Now, if I could add a sixth feature to this, I would say the role of Mexico, right? So Mexico periodically also being part uh, of uh, um, uh, energy discussions in North America beyond just Mexico-US discussions, but actually bringing it up to the level of trilateral discussions, and that's something I'm going to come back to uh, in a little bit. But overall, we've really had relatively stable, and from both an industry perspective but also government perspective, relatively predictable energy relations between Canada and the United States. Uh, but the times, as Professor Crandall's presentation made clear, the times are a change. It has uh, really fundamentally, uh, there's some major transformations underway. Most notably, of course, the shale uh, revolution, so the rapid rise in unconventional oil and gas production in the United States. Um, in terms of oil, the U.S., uh, now there were a number of, of wonderful um, graphs shown earlier, but just a few you know, quick points here. The U.S. halved its oil imports since 2006. I mean, can you imagine in five, six short years uh, cutting them in half? And increased gas production by about 30%. So I can remember being at a conference in, I think it was 2007, 2008, and the discussion was about importing LNG. The discussion was about energy you know, in North America. We have major deficit, deficits in the area of natural gas. Uh, we've got all of these proposals coming forward. I think there were 40 proposals for LNG uh, facilities. Maybe we needed half a dozen. Now, as Professor Crandall pointed out, uh, it's not looking in the U.S. anyways like we're going to need any, uh, not, for the next, uh, not for the next number of years. So if you look at projections, and I'll just again quickly point out a few things here. Uh, it's projected, a recent Citigroup uh, report uh, projected that the U.S. can eliminate imports from the Middle East and other hostile suppliers within five years. I mean, that's a fundamental shift with potential geopolitical um, uh, implications, as, as has been pointed out already. Uh, the U.S. is slated to be the largest oil producer by 2020. It's already the largest gas uh, producer. It's slated to be a net natural gas exporter by 2020. I mean, this is uh, the, the, the transformation in, in a very short period of time uh, is, is really phenomenal. And oil imports are set in, to the United States are set to decline from 50% of consumption to 30% uh, between now and 2035. So a real, uh, a real shift in that. So what does that mean in terms of impacts? Well, the, the thing that I pointed out at the outset of my presentation that I'd like to come back to is that uncertainty reigns supreme. Um, with this level of change, this rapidity of change, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, in the marketplace, but also in terms of policy uh, as well. So if we look at that, the, the energy mess, market environment, security, and social acceptability, just a couple of quick points because I see my time uh, flying by here. But if you look at markets, for example, uh, you know, prices obviously have declined. Right? We've got um, across oil, gas, and electricity. And that's something I'm going to come, come back to in a, here in a moment. We've got major infrastructure constraints. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, 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 the metaphor of sort of energy policy and energy markets being large cruise liners that take time to shift when it comes to infrastructure, that is absolutely the case. And so the infrastructure that we've got in place doesn't necessarily reflect where the key production areas are uh, certainly emerging and, and looking like um, the major 
producing areas in, uh, in the future. So for example, in the Bakken, where we've got not only um, shale oil being produced, but there's also uh, shale gas, a lot of that gas is being flared. Uh, they just don't have, they don't have the infrastructure to take it anywhere, right? Um, also in terms of uncertainty, projections, right? Nothing so, is so hard to predict uh, as the future. Um, will these shale oil and shale gas fields actually be as productive as they seem to be or will there be a, uh, you know, a, a tapering off more rapidly uh, than has been projected? So there's um, you know, certainly some uncertainty around that. And in terms of inter-industry dynamics, uh, this is one of the fascinating areas, looking at energy interacting with transportation. Right, so it, uh, the changes in, um, like in the Bakken, for example, I mean, who would have thought that now in the United States that the rail lines, which we thought, well, what are we going to do with the, with the railways if we reduce coal-fired generation? What, are they, what the heck are the railways going to carry? Well, now we know what they're carrying, right? So they've made a phenomenal shift towards actually carrying, uh, uh, carrying oil. Um, uh, we're seeing also, of course, you know, the, the, the impl implications that this can have in terms of transportation vehicles as well. So the electric electrification of vehicles, um, the uh, use of uh, natural gas uh, in transportation, um, particularly when it comes to long haul trucking uh, and other return to fleet type of uh, uh, type of operations. Um, we're also seeing a changing use of existing infrastructure, right? So changing the, the directional d direction of flow of existing infrastructure. On the environment, of course, we have new challenges uh, in terms of fracking and some of the environmental um, um, concerns that have arisen as a result uh, of fracking. And again, there, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, not only in, in technical terms, right? So there, we've got all these studies going on right now to try to assess what, uh, um, you know, what the um, uh, sort of the real um, issues are around fracking, but also in regulatory terms as well. Because in the United States, fracking, the jurisdiction is at the, at the state level. And so we've got this patchwork quilt of approaches to fracking across the U.S. with some jurisdictions full steam ahead and others placing moratoriums on, uh, uh, on the process. Um, in terms of security, obviously this mean, means uh, some very interesting discussions now taking place in the United States uh, in terms of, North, of American energy security and the capacity for, North Amer or for em American uh, energy self-sufficiency um, and the um, you know, ability in the future to be able to really wean down the, end the extent of energy imports, particularly uh, in gas but also, uh, also in oil. This also has prompted some uh, discussion here in Canada that I'm going to come back to in a moment around um, Canadian energy strategies. And I would argue the reason that a lot of that is coming up is because of the changing market dynamics, which, again, I'll talk about again in a moment. Um, we've also got social acceptability, of course, becoming um, increasingly uh, germane in this area, particularly when it comes to fracking. But one of the fascinating things to watch is that in the United, in the United States, in, any, in, uh, in a number of, of regions in the United States, given the economic downturn and the high unemployment in many uh, communities, the development of shale resources represents fundamental uh, um, opportunities in terms of turning their economies around. You know, so turning a, a, uh, turning a city like Williston from you know, a couple thousand people uh, to now they're looking at uh, maybe this community being uh, many, many times, uh, many, many times larger than that. It's also meant as well something that, I mean, who would have thought that the chemical industry would be coming back to the United States? Who would have thought that steel is starting to be produced again in the United States? We've got a real manufacturing renaissance potentially underway in the U.S. because of these uh, uh, resources coming in uh, and really um, reducing prices and increasing availability. So all of this to say, again, a, a, an environment with tremendous, um, uh, tremendous uncertainty and tremendous change. So what does this mean for Canada-U.S. relations? Um, well, it means that U.S. market opportunities for Canada might be weakening. So what do we do about that? Um, the oil sands, it's often said that the oil, oil sands face a double discount in price, right? that they face a discount between the West Texas intermediate price and the price for Brent crude. Uh, and the, the difference there has been anywhere between about $10 and $20 since about 2010. So we've gone from a couple of you know, dollars uh, spread between those two benchmarks uh, to something much wider over the last uh, couple of years. 
And then if you're the oil sands, you also face a discount of Western Canadian Select, uh, the, the, the benchmark for um, the oil sands oil, against West Texas Intermediate. So even within uh, North America. And that discount, that spread, used to be about $10 in 2009 on, on average. And now in, in 2012, it was up to $21. And it hit a historic high of $42.50 on uh, December, I think it was mid-December uh, 2012. So you add up those two discounts and you've got um, oil sands oil looking at international markets and thinking why should we not be trying to access international markets. I would argue that the oil sands actually face a triple discount. So the first two that I've just talked about, but the third discount is that they're discounted by environmentalists. Uh, in the United States largely, so that you have a real, as, as um, your presentation made clear, um, um, you know, a, a real sort of public relations uh, challenge for the, uh, for the oil sands in the United States. We've also got natural gas exports to the United States decreasing uh, for Canadian, uh, Canadian producers. So for Canadian producers, they're looking at being in a, a situation where they're increasingly landlocked in a hydrocarbon rich North America which was something that nobody <laughs> was projecting, certainly not, uh, uh, not uh, most observers, uh, at least even five years ago. And that's really the rationale for the Keystone XL pipeline. But I would also argue it's one of the reasons why we've got all these discussions around do we need a national energy strategy for Canada, because that begins putting into, calling into question the historic north-south Canada-US relations towards thinking about shipping resources in an east-west uh, orientation. So I'm seeing time fly by. So what I'm going to end on is to say, so what are governments doing um, in response to this? A and I would argue um, that they're missing the mark. One of the things that um, Brigadier General Hamel said that I thought was very interesting when he was talking about partnerships in the north between you know, a variety of agencies, Canadian, American, and I took this down, I hope I sort of got it right, but you, you said that you would come together and you would exchange with one another and foresee what's coming up in terms of challenges and ways to see ahead. We're not doing that, not in North America around energy. We're barely doing it in Canada around energy. And I would argue, and I would uh, agree with uh, um, a number of the comments that have been made previously, that we are in the midst of a, a generational shift in terms of energy in North America, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of use. What kind of energy future do we want to have uh, in North America? And should we be having governments and industry and uh, uh, other societal actors be coming together to be looking uh, at these issues in meaningful ways, to be actually developing, whether it's a plan or even just exchanging, so that we have some sense of what are the challenges going forward and what might we be looking at uh, to do that. And one of the fascinating things about energy is that not only is it an industry in and of itself, which is primarily how we've been talking about it here today, but it's also, of course, a key input into competitiveness, into productivity. If we're thinking about North America and North American, competitiveness, um, certainly to have a well-functioning energy system, whether it's north-south or east-west, uh, is uh, something that would benefit all three countries. And here I would include Mexico as well, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the discussion uh, session, session uh, for today. Um, and I would just like to, to sort of close by saying we've done this before. Governments have come together before. Not only Canada, US, and Mexico. We used to have a thing called the North American Energy Working Group that did that, right? That looked to the future, that talked about problems, that you know, uh, sort of brought the relevant people together. We're not doing that uh, right now. Domestically, there used to be, and I, say, I would say pre-national energy program, I've done some historical research now looking at sort of this idea of a national energy strategy. We've talked about national approaches to energy in this country before. When, when we came to the national energy program, that then, I argue in a very long paper I've just written, but that has really instilled a norm of hyper-competitive federalism in the country that has meant that even where there are shared interests, it's very difficult. Uh, for provinces to come together and actually be able to, to address some of these uh, issues, even though it might be in their collective 
uh, interest. And so all of this to say that uh, um, you know, my view would be that governments can more effectively address their collective energy mess, market, environment, security, uh, and social acceptability, but they need to learn how to sort of walk and chew gum uh, at the same time. Thank you very much.